Today's episode is brought to you by AOS Kitchens, the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists. Hello, Dan here from the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast. This is part two of our conversation with Dan from Urban Streetery. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to another episode of the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast. Uh, this episode, we are speaking to Dan from Urban Streetery. Bit of a warning here. It's a fantastic episode and there's a little bit of swearing in it. So if you're listening around little ears, maybe thinking about listening to it when you're by yourself. But some of the things that Dan's talking about are so important. We didn't want to cut any of that content at all. It's a fantastic episode. I hope you love it as much as we did recording it. Do like, subscribe and review this podcast. It really helps us get the word of the podcast out there and helps people find us. That does make a big difference, particularly if you give us five stars. Without much further ado, here's Dan. You've spoken a lot about the experimentation, I suppose, which comes naturally part of the job. I suppose with experimentation comes some failures in when you're testing things out. And obviously we love to celebrate barbecue fails on the podcast. So we'd be interested to know some of the things that perhaps didn't work so well or any other fails that you might have uh, encountered in your well, life. I've, I've had two. One very recent, actually. Um, so last uh, weekend, um, I was asked, by James, James Lowe Butchers um, to cater for his sister's 40th birthday. And he, he makes the most amazing Texas link sausages. Um, I travelled to Texas and they are spot on to what I had when we were in Dallas. But he decided to make these ones with Wagyu beef. And obviously everyone knows Wagyu is fatty. Um, I hung these uh, bad boys up on the fire cage and within five minutes I thought I was going to burn his gazebo down <laughs> because uh, all the sausages that went on um, got so hot that they split that the fire uh, the fat trickled down straight onto the fire and the thing went up like it was a crematorium <laughs> um, with me and foul tattooed smoker who has been my right hand man the last couple of weeks were tearing these sausages straight off of the hooks onto his cooler barbecue. Um, but yeah, at one point I thought the thing that I thought we were going to burn the rugby club down that we were catering that <laughs> it just went up. Death um, by hot links. Yeah, death by hot links. Um, <laughs> the whole thing just went sky high. It was it was sort of fifty feet in the air flames, but they they died down very quickly after we moved them. But yeah. Um, left with uh, a nice sort of black sausage at the end of it. Um, <laughs> that, that, and when you're doing a catering gig, that's not the best part of it. Um, <laughs> other, other than that, it's things, like, what else have, oh, I know. Um, so when I first got the fire cage, um, did a lovely roast dinner on there, but um, it, there's, a, there's a thing called a trencher. It's a um, medieval, it's almost like a Yorkshire pudding. It's like a cross between a Yorkshire pudding and a sponge. Um, and the idea is you, you cook, cook the meat underneath it. Sorry, the trencher goes underneath the meat and soaks up all the, the juices, the blood. Um, and it's effectively like a bread stroke Yorkshire that's cooked with dripping or lard or whatever you're cooking. Anyway, I made this thing and I, I, followed, I followed a recipe. It was a, an old medieval recipe that I found. But the thing was like a, a brick. You could have <laughs> killed something with it. It was <laughs> hard. It was dense. It was charred on the bottom. Um, we ended up leaving it out to the birds, but even they left it. It was that bad. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was, yeah, that was probably the worst, the worst thing I've ever cooked in the world. That was a proper epic fail. Have you tried it again since? I have tried it simply once more since, and it sort of worked a little bit better, but I think I'll stick to just making you look pretty. Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I had a little fail the other day. Um, I did a uh, great, uh, it's probably the best chicken that I've done on the Kamado. Did, did a whole chicken on there, it was great. And I thought, I want to make a phenomenal gravy to go with it. So set it up and then had the deflector plate. I used like half moon deflector plate, which I put underneath the chicken. And I left the other side just to be able to manage the heat a bit better. And I put a tray underneath the chicken and I thought, right, I'm going to catch all these juices and I'm going to make a great gravy from it. So I put in some onions in there. I put a bit of celery and carrot in there. And I was just waiting for this to come down. And also some of the giblets and stuff from the chicken as well. What I didn't do was add any moisture at the start. And I'd also misunderstood how hot the deflector plate would get. So it caught all the fat and stuff. Great. But it lit all of that fat just went rock hard and black and stuff. And it didn't inflect the flavor of the chicken. That was amazing. But there was no way that I was getting any gravy out of rock hard <laughs> black um, mass of uh, basically a volcano is what I was left with on there. <laughs> but also like all of the onions and stuff. I, I literally had to throw out the pan that I was using underneath because I could not get them off. And the meal was fantastic. But the whole time I was thinking bloody gravy would have been amazing with this. um it's it's easily done and it's little things like that that even if you've been cooking long uh, for years you overlook these things particularly if you're trying something slightly oh, definitely. different definitely especially with barbecues as well there's such a um, variability in kit there's all of the different um fundamentals as well if it's a windy day your barbecue's going to react differently if it's a cold day it's going to react differently um when I was down at SoCal, it was the first time I had used proper big green eggs and they work completely differently to, I've got an Ovo Kamado and they work in a completely different way. It's still a ceramic barbecue, works in a completely different way to the uh, Ovo. Um, it was the first time I used a trader as well, which um, I've, lucky enough I'm getting one delivered next week as well. I've got an Ironwood 885 on its way. Um, again, something that I never thought in a million years that I would like it cooking on because it's a pellet grill. I've always been one of the ones that have taken the piss. It's one of those easy bake ovens, as uh, our good friend Corky would call it. But it was incredible, in all honesty. Um, I did some lamb barbacoa on there, um, marinated it. Um, in a chocolate habanero jelly. Um, oh, that's so good. And then it's absolutely incredible stuff as well. It's made by the Welsh Homestead Smokery. Mm -hmm. um, Claire um, that runs there, she sent me a box down of amazing goodies, and this stuff is absolutely incredible. Anyway, rubbed over lamb, it's even better. Um, but the first time I've got to try to use the Traeger because being down there, it was. Bloody windy the day that we went for the masterclass, and I thought, right, I've never used any of these barbecues before, and I know, I know how to start a fire. Everything else was quick cut. It was green. It was um, pork tomahawks, um, and it was um, just keep flipping um, short ribs. So everything was quick cut. But because I knew that lamb needed a low and slow, and it was windy. I didn't know the barbecues. And I said to Charles, look, I want to use the Traeger for that because I know that that is a set and forget. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, right, he said, what temperature do you want it um, set at? And I said, 250, thinking it was the barbecue way. Uh, he thought I meant centigrade. Set <laughs> 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 it at 250C. And obviously... I'm sitting there thinking, shit, so this thing started sizzling as I put it on. I'm like, oh, this is it. he said, this is a set of centigrade. I was like, no, Fahrenheit, we're talking barbecue easy. Once we set it back, it cooked for four and a half hours, beautifully tender. Smoke ring was absolutely incredible. And I was won over by pellet grills. Um, it's so easy to control. Whereas things like the fire cage, as much as I love that excitement of cooking over fire, those variables can, or could have done, could have ruined that party because of how 
quickly that fire went out of control. Mm -hmm. Something like the pellet grill, for me, means that I can now do slow and low without that worry of having to take a day off to control the fire. Mm -hmm. I can literally put, on this bloody thing that's coming, I can put nine whole pork shoulders, pork butts, at half six in the morning, get back home in the evening, wrap them, and take them to the event the next day. And that is going to save my life a lot of hours, a lot of hassle, <laughs> and a lot of holiday days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just opened up a new way of cooking for me. Um, it means that when, and it's going to happen in the next few months, when my little boy wants to start playing football and he wants to join football teams, it means that I can set barbecue in the morning, go out and not, again, not have to worry about turn into a fire or worrying about shit we need to get back because I know that that charcoal is going to be run out. I know that I can just monitor it on my phone. Um, I know that there's there's pros and cons to it because it's not going to be all smoked like it would be in an offset. But it was bloody good what I had. Um, and you wouldn't really know the difference. Um, for that length of time of cooking, if you did four and a half hours an offset, I don't think you would get the same results because you've got that, again, that variables of wind intake, uh, the, the day that you're, which way your barbecue needs to go around. And <laughs> yeah. The, you know what I mean? It's, um, it just takes some of those elements out of it, but still getting consistently good barbecue. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've got the uh, 885. Um, I, I got, yeah, so I ordered mine after one or seven, eight beers at Sizzle Fest last yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, I couldn't set it up till November until I moved house. So I literally started using it just before Christmas. I did my first brisket on it, um, New Year. And like you said, it was super simple, really easy to do. Um, however, for all that ease, I didn't get I didn't get the smoke ring I was hoping for, and I'm using this limited edition Meat Church blend. Yeah, I had it on super smoke mode, but it just it it was uh, really tasty. It was super, you know, just had a little bite and it pulled. You put it on your finger, it all bent and did all the stuff that it was supposed to do, but it just lacked of that nice pink that ring. red, yeah, ring. I was a bit disappointed in, uh, that. We used the cherry pellet. And I've always found that any time I've used cherry wood, that's what gives the best smoke ring. Yeah. Um, I've got boxes and boxes of chunks and chickens, and I've always found that cherry gives the best ring. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's because what kind the, the sort of um, what's coming out of it is just aiding to that, um, but it's always been cherry. So I've, I used. So on my um, Bristol drum and my Camargo, I use um, hot smoke Dorset wood chunks. Um, but the whiskey barrel ones, they're incredible. Oh, that sounds exciting. Packet, you open the packet and you're half cut before you even started barbecue. <laughs> but there's a lot of places that do whiskey barrel and sort of old Jack Daniel barrels and things like that. But there's never any, you open it and you sort of sniff it and go, ah, oh, really? This you sniff it and go, whoa, bloody hell. <laughs> I'm still like a bit of distillery. Um, <laughs> uh, good. But they, um, that takes some good flavour. It doesn't get, uh, again, I haven't had ma massive smoke out of it, but the flavour. But yeah, that, um, I, I was impressed with the cherry pellet. But I was going to get the meat church um, pellets. Um, Charles was going to send me some. Because um, they've got some new ones out as well. There's a brisket blend. There's got Always black pepper tea. through the pellet. Yeah, there's oh, some black okay. pepper through it. I think it's oak, mesquite, and black pepper. And there's another signature, a new signature blend that's actually got rosemary through it as well. So again, with lamb, be like, amazing. Yeah, a bit like we were talking earlier about how you can up the ante with flavours. Companies like that are now bringing out flavoured woods. So you've not just got a a standard wood, an apple wood, a cherry wood. Uh, a birch wood, whatever. You've now got these pellets that you can, they're adding 
Woody, Flato, Rosemary, they, I think they're going to be developing a lot more of these sort of flavoured wood pellets, um, which can only be a good thing. I'm going to get some to trial um, a couple of ideas. Let, let um, me know how you get on. Yeah, yeah, I will do, mate, because, like I said, I was definitely an advocate of the other direction with pellet girls. I was always, no, 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 I'm never going to use one. It's cheating. It's this. But the way my life is now, it will massively help me with my career and the events that I do and and just general life. Um, I'm sure you find it yourself. You can yeah. like, you set up to get it. Um, it's a good mid, it's a good that. midweek barbecue. Exactly. If that's the sort of thing. And midweek or if we've got something going on at the weekend with the family, it's something that I can still know that it's it's, it's basically a slow cooker. It's yeah. probably the same conversation that Christ, eighty years ago our grandparents were like, No, that's cheating, we we can't that's that's not, not using the Arga. Yeah. We should put that in a pan in the yoga and forget about the slow cooker. The, the, that's cheating. It's exactly the same thing. It's just another tool that will aid people's busy life. Mm. It's still pretty, you can create consistently good food at the touch of a button. It's the same as the microwave. It's the same as the slow cooker. It's just a new invention in barbecue. Yeah. And I didn't have that view before until I actually used it. And I think a lot of people have that view until they use it um and the same with a lot of things the same with sous vide sous vide's an old technique but it's just been modernized by companies using different water bars and things not that i like sous vide in the slightest but i like it for vegetables i couldn't stand it for meat i think it just takes the meat that's been sous vide takes on this weird livery livery taste and um texture <laughs> but it has its place and all of these things they're not invented and sold to the point where they are now if they didn't help people it wouldn't mm -hmm. have ever got to the stage where yeah, someone exactly. would go have you got the new trader model what's the trader everyone knows what a trader is because of that reason um and they are talking points they are controversial if you're a traditionalist but like i said it I like to, I, I've now I've tested it. There's a lot of things I want to try on it. Um, I don't know if you follow uh, Matt Pittman, um, Meat Church. No, I don't. He's got the, meat church, the Meat Church pellet. M Matt Pittman's the guy that, well, it is the owner of Meat Church. Yeah. Um, and on his website, he's got some incredible slow and low recipes, traditional um, barbecue stuff. But he's got on there at the moment bacon brisket. So it's, it's cooking a pork belly in the same way you would cook a brisket. And it looks absolutely stunning. That's one of the first things I'm going to cook on there when it comes. Because yes. you're just literally treating the pork belly in exactly the same way. You're just using salt and pepper, a binder, putting it on, but using the same wood, even though it's pork, you're using the same strong, strong smoke flavours, hickory, oats. Um, but you've got that piggy flavour instead of a beefy flavour but looking at it I think it could be it will be the new pork belly burnt end or those sort of the, the bacon wrapped Oreos the next thing that will just be on Instagram constantly but yeah. I want to do mine so you'll see that coming up as well do you know what? those Great. sort of things they sound like they'd be so sweet you could serve them with like ice cream do you know what I mean? Yeah. Although it's like meaty and savoury, it just, it feels like it would almost give you like a, a an interesting dessert feel because you can just think of all the fat that's in a pork belly. It's going to render beautiful <laughs> in there, yeah. but it, it, it pairs with sweetness so much, uh, well, better really than beef does. Do you know what I mean? It's, that could only be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Do you know yeah, the biggest benefit I've right. had from... Sorry, I was going to say, you know, the biggest benefit I've found with the, the uh, Ironwood 885 is cooking breakfast. I love cooking, oh, right. I love a barbecue breakfast. And, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, you can cook 15, 20 sausages, 10 rashes of bacon. You know, I have the pan for eggs. I have a tin of beans going. I have hash browns, 
grilled tomatoes all at once and I'm you know serving seven eight people where I couldn't do that on a Weber kettle or I couldn't do that on a broiled yeah. king keg or just the sheer cooking volume I've I've actually used it more for cooking breakfasts than anything else that's interesting because I haven't done that is one thing I see quite a lot um but I've, I've never really cooked breakfast I don't even think I have done a breakfast Oh, so good on a barbecue. Mm. So good on a barbecue. Obviously, I've cooked bacon on the barbecue, I've cooked sausages on the barbecue, but I've never been out there and done a breakfast. That's, that's not something I need to do. There we go. There's something I'll, I'll add to the list. Of, uh, <laughs> sure. There's something about being like, there's something about being hungover and you've got that on the barbecue. And for me, uh, different in a trade girl, of course, but just getting a tin of beans taking the lid off and put that in the coals while you're cooking everything else and you're letting some of the fat drip down into the beans when you're hungover, that'll fix you before you've even started eating it. It's gorgeous. That, 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 that sounds like I want to go and do that tomorrow morning. Right? <laughs> oh, so good. <laughs> so good. If you've been looking or thinking about an outdoor kitchen, then look no further than AOS Outdoor Kitchens. They are the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists. Their extensive showroom is based just outside Bournemouth on the Dorset Hampshire border and as well as numerous in-store displays also features a live outdoor kitchen where they cook every week on Kamado grills, pizza ovens and all filmed and shown on YouTube. They offer a wealth of knowledge on how to transform your patio into the most incredible outdoor dining area with styles and options to suit every budget and you can guarantee they will be able to create something perfectly suited to you and your home. They stock and supply everything that you're going to need for outdoor cooking, including barbecues, Kamado ovens, pizza ovens, outdoor fridges, and every accessory that you would need to become the ultimate outdoor chef. So if you want to make yourself the envy of your friends and neighbours, get in touch with them today to arrange a consultation and take the first step in transforming your back garden into the most incredible entertainment space. Visit aoskitchens.co.uk. Should we, uh, should we move on to barbecue bingo? We've time. been talking about lots of ingredients. Should we, uh, should we set you a challenge, Dan? Yeah, I like a challenge. Let's have a challenge. So while right. Owen sets it up, um, I'll run through it. So what we do every single episode is Owen and I sit down and deliberate about some interesting uh, ingredients or meals that someone could do on a barbecue. We stick them in a spinning wheel. And we ask our guests to cook whatever comes up, uh, use the hashtag barbecue bingo when they do it and put it online. And we also share it and make sure that all of our audience sees it as well. But it just lets people know what you can do with a barbecue and gives you something fun to play with. Now, Owen's uh, launched the wheel, as it were. Is there anything interesting on there which jumps out at you or anything that you're allergic to? Because we've had that before as well. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, not, I'm not allergic to anything. Um, but yeah, some of the things that we've been talking about, like the pastry dish, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, whiskey, talking about the whiskey um, barrels. Uh, yeah, there's some nice stuff on there. I promise forward, I yeah. have. I, I promise I haven't been loading this when you've been talking about those <laughs> ingredients. This was pretty done. What about my signature dish? So we put this in every single uh, episode, and it's really allowing you to showcase your best type of cooking. But for you, what's your signature dish? Ah. Uh... It, again, this has changed over the years. Um, I would say it's probably my go-to dish that would be, if I was doing, it would probably be a taco. It would probably be one of my tacos. It will probably be, uh, I'll tell you what, it would be my castor can pork belly taco. Um, mm. So castor can pork belly is a pork belly that's been comfy to start with. So you take um, some duck fat or pork fat, comfy the pork, until it's softer than soft. Take it out, take the fat off of it, let it go cold, chunk it up, get a plancher and you crisp it up. But then you sprinkle cheese over the top of it on the plancher. And I don't know if you've got a brittle sandwich toaster or you've done a cheese toasty, all the little brown and crispy bits of the cheese. Yeah. That's what molds all this pork together. And Keep going, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. Keep going. <laughs> 
<laughs> you flip it over that crisp stuff and then I serve it with a um, pineapple and habanero salsa, uh, the IPA pickled onion and some coriander. And yeah, that, that has been sort of a, a staple of my taco menu since I started the street oh, Can had... you come round can you come <laughs> round tomorrow and cook? <laughs> yeah. We've had so many guests and none of their signature dishes when they're describing them have made me almost cry before. <laughs> <laughs> I transcended that's what I them. That's what I have to get out at Sizzle Fest. That's what I have to do yeah. at Sizzle Fest. Definitely. <laughs> right, let's give it a spin. Oh, uh, it's going to do it, isn't it? Oh, oh not no, quite. <laughs> Cool, we can do that. We can do that. I thought it was going to go for the dessert then. Um, <laughs> After what we were saying about the dessert. <laughs> like, so jalapenos with your um, expertise in Mexican, uh, <laughs> what what jumps to your head that's different that people probably haven't seen before? Um, so, other than salsas and um, the traditional sort of poppers, um, wrapping them in things, but there is one thing that comes to mind, and I don't know if you guys have heard of them. They're called armadillo eggs. No, um, that's a, it's it's a it's, it's effectively a. I think it's from Alabama, but they it's effectively like a Scotch egg. <laughs> so you take a jalapeno, you stuff it with cream cheese, then you wrap it in bacon, then you wrap it in sausage meat, then you wrap it in breadcrumbs. And then you cook it, and then Sounds you put good. a barbecue sauce on the outside of it and stuff like that. So I'm thinking that could be a that could be a thing, but I'm going to push it. I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to surprise everyone, and it's going to be something. Yeah, I've got I've got a good idea from what I'm going to do. It's not going to be a tradition. It's not going to be a pop up. It's not going to be a salsa. But I've got some ideas that. It might incorporate a couple of the things that were on that wheel. I mean, I was really hoping to get you were going to get the sweet pastry dish, to be honest. But <laughs> I, I've got a whole conversation around that. I, I've got a cook that I've been planning for a little while, um, which I'm hoping to do over the next few weeks. And I want to get your take on it. So we, I've mentioned on here a few times, but Owen and I have been talking for ages about desserts um, on the barbecue. And I've been talking about doing cookies and things like that and done some brownie stuff on there. But I really want to do a Bakewell tart with cherry wood. Yeah, it, it, ju like it just just feels exciting and different. <laughs> but again, it's I don't feel like I'm quite experienced enough because you want to get the smokiness mm. in there, but you also want to get the temperature right because pastry is quite uh, unforgiving if you That's get it wrong. The thing, the, thing the, the biggest tip I'll give you from doing other tarts on the barbecue is roll your pastry out and then in your tart case stick that in the freezer overnight yeah so that potion starts super cold and when you put stuff frozen onto the barbecue it does something magic and takes on bit more smoke i did not I've well seen... i did not know that but we've been talking about um chilling potatoes before you roast them on a the barbecue for i'm assuming the same theory behind it yeah there's um there's, I think it's something to do with water particles and the ice and stuff like that. That uh, I saw again, it might work with the trader as well. Um, with your brisket, that I've seen things that if you want it for when it's competition barbecue, stick in the brisket in the freezer first, because then all of that smoke clings to the water and it does some sort of magic and creates the most incredible smoke ring. And that's what a lot of the competition guys do. Well, well it's not was cooking it from frozen. You're almost not, so it's not frozen solid. Yeah. You're chilling it down in the freezer. So it's as cold as it could possibly be without freezing it. Yeah. But there's something that happens when the meat is so cold on the outside that smoke is attracted to, and it will create the best smoke ring. I think a lot of the barbecue books and a lot of competition barbecue especially uses that technique to create the best smoke ring they can. Um, and a lot of sort of food photography is, is very doctored, but not with a computer. 
um, some of the things that I've sort of learned over the years from when I've had photo shoots and things like that for restaurants and books that I've sort of had the sort of honour of adding recipes to. And the food photographers come down and things like, if they don't want the food served uh, for hot because the, the steam and the smoke that comes off of the plate, would they have it with the, the lens? So there's tips of like hot towels that are put behind the uh, plate to give off that steam. Um, so yeah, one of the tricks is yeah getting the meat as cold as possible for smoke rings, which is the complete opposite of like bringing the meat up to room temperature and. But it is something that when I did the pastry, you definitely want super cold frozen pastry because as soon as you put that pastry onto the barbecue at, or into a hot oven, into an oven, is, you haven't got those variables that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know that when you stick it in the oven, it's going to be 180 degrees. In the barbecue, it might say on the temperature um, thermometer, which a lot of people forget that that's the temperature at the top of your barbecue. Yeah, that's heat rises. Yeah. yeah. That's not the temperature at grill level. So you are putting that pastry on, and already it's starting, it's not about 180, 200 degrees. It's probably 10, 20 degrees less than that. So it's taking a lot longer to cook. So that fat is melting, and you'll end up with pastry that's shrunk. So as soon as you put your frangipan pan in for your bake or or if you're putting, I don't know, a lemon curd mix in for lemon tart, you've instantly lost A, the structure of the tart, B, you're losing the amount of filling that you're going to put into it because of that reason it shrunk down. Or if you've got one of these pastry cases that's either got holes in the bottom that helps it bake, it'll all be seeping through the bottom. You need to make sure that unless that pastry is frozen and then you can get it all, it'll all cook at a sort of even temperature. So yeah, that's my tip. That's my tip for the bake for a start is to get your pastry super, super cold. Amazing. We'll try it out on the brisket for the trade go as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've um, obviously learned more about you know what, what your plans are for this year and you know how you got into barbecue. Is there anything that we've perhaps not discussed so far um, that you would like to kind of you know, bring up, I suppose, is there anything that's happening in the barbecue scene that perhaps we don't talk about enough or, or anything like that? So, two things that I've got coming up. One of them is the Savage Retreat, which I'm so excited to be asked to be part of. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, it's a three-day fire cooking retreat um, just south of Nottingham, which is where the cages are made. Um, and there's me, um, Jürgen, um, yeah. and I'm doing so I know you guys have spoken to. Yeah. A Spice Punch, um, who's doing a class on um, dry age, dry aging meat, because he does a lot of that on his page. Um, then there's Mikey from um, Fire Masters UK, who do, is doing a master class on sort of South African woods, sort of African woods. Um, and then a few other guys, but it's just going to be three days of cooking, eating and drinking over the fire. And I'm so excited to be part of it. Um, I think this is the first of many by the sound of it. And the other thing is just the things that Russ has been doing, but, and well, I say Russ, the community. Russ is the sort of thing of it, but the hashtag Q together. Um, through this last couple of years, like I said, uh, this sort of community is getting me going because of coming from a world where, or now a world where I'm working in a restaurant that I'm actually working in front of 200 people. So I'm seeing 200 people a day, I was seeing 200 people a day, chatting to people all the time. But then talking to no one mm -hmm. really messes with your head. Mm -hmm. So starting off this Instagram and then finding people at the start, people like Corky and Bruchak Phil and Dom, Tom, all of those guys that were there in the early days that started off groups and then 
I expanded to the to what Sizzlefest was, mm-hmm. and then meet you guys and meeting Fowl and all of the others. And I speak to all of these guys more than I speak to my own friends now. I class everyone as a close friend because we're constantly talking. The Rusty guys are in a group. We've got groups for the Savage guys, and we talk every day about shit. <laughs> and in this world it's it's a very strange world that we live in now mm-hmm. we've got yeah. coronavirus going on we've got the government stitching us up with looking up in parties where we couldn't and <laughs> now the whole thing with Russia and Ukraine we've got the fucking pretty shit footballers beating the cats we've got fucking <laughs> everything going on but to have a back our backs of this barbecue community has been a massive thing where we can mm-hmm. forget about that world and just talk about a smoke ring around a brisket or how long to chill a uh, short breath pastry for for a baked work up or the next Six Nations game. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I haven't got that with any friends at the moment. I've got that with these guys, you guys. And it's a massive thing, and it's a thing that I think needs to grow more and have more um, get behind it. I know there's us, but I think it needs to start going out into mainstream world mm-hmm. of a group of guys and girls that just love this community. It's almost like it needs a charity behind it. I know the Burnt Chef Project do a lot for chefs, but this isn't chefs, this is just everyday people cooking, chatting, drinking, having a good time to keep everyone else's mental health up. And someone, like mind, is, someone like Mind would be good. Yeah. Exactly. But um, starting, yeah, starting a movement where it's uh, all of us talking about our own... You, like you said, you've got Mind, there's, there's some other guys that... Um, it just needs to be pushed out to a wider audience um, because it is just the Instagram guys, it's us. We are queuing together every day, chatting together. But if we can push it more and more, that can save someone. Oh, yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, we've talked a lot on the podcast about how good barbecue is for well-being. But more about the actual art of spending more time outside, having some time to relax yourself and some new time. But we haven't touched upon this point, which is actually very, very close to me and some personal stuff that um, the community that I was part of when I was young had been through. But men don't talk enough. We don't. We, We don't talk about our emotions. We don't talk to each other enough at all. It's something that's well documented. Right. Um. But I hadn't really considered what you've said, but you're exactly right. This community, even if it's just talking about anything, right? Uh, it's talking about the sky today is redder than normal. Does that mean that we should barbecue differently? Do you know what I mean? Um, but it, it gives you the opportunity to talk to other people in a, a, a particularly safe space where if someone's very lonely, having a bad time, whatever, they don't have the opportunity. I don't feel like maybe they can talk to other men in that way. Whereas this is a lot more of a safe place to do it. So if anyone's having trouble listening to this, reach out and speak to people. And as you've said, the barbecue community, very friendly, very forgiving and want to have everyone's back. You never see people criticizing each other on the barbecue <coughs> community. It, it just doesn't they happen. Do it. They do it. It's generally bad for yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got a trade, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got no problem. Yeah, but it's um, it's something that uh, there's another chef down here that um, we both have chatted about. Is this the whole men's mental health? Men don't talk. There's a there's a small charity down here. Uh, it's not even really a charity. It's called Andy's Man Club. I think they've got them around the country now. Um, there's one specific. Uh, particularly down in Little Hampton. And me and the chef from a restaurant called Hellions, um, Chef Gaz, are going to do a men's mental health barbecue night. Um, wow. Whether it's a masterclass, whether it's just to get together and we stick a load of food down the table, just to get men talking. 
we said, and we weren't being sexist, we were saying everywhere you go, you see it's ladies' night, it's hen party night, it's uh, ladies at lunch. There's never anything for blokes. It's always associated when the blokes go out, it's to go and get pissed and watch football or watch the rugby. But to have a place where this becomes reality, mm -hmm. a bit like Sizzle Fest. Yeah. Sizzle Fest was probably not as in uh, family life or anything, but it was probably one of the happiest times in my last probably three or four years mm -hmm. because we all were there for the same reason. Yeah. It's not a rugby match or a football match where you're against another opposition and you're there for the football, but you're also there for the banter to shout abuse at other people. Yeah. It wasn't a stag do where you're out with everyone Although it felt a little bit like a stag do. You're out <laughs> with everyone for one reason, but everyone ends up splitting away or you end up seeing fights and you, you're sort of that on edge all the time in case something kicks off. Everyone was there for that reason. To chat, to drink, to eat good food, to talk about food, talk about equipment, be a bit geeky. It's almost like, the, that was almost like the Comic Con of barbecue. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I want to start, and this is what me and Daz were saying, we want to start seeing groups of guys around a table talking to each other like we're doing now, like we do in WhatsApp groups, or like me and the Rusty guys do when we do the key together things uh, in the four windows. We want to see groups of guys doing that around the table, get together, either cook together, or just even just eat together, not just drink and bottle up the barmaid, get together and chat and talk and tell of your problems, talk about problems. But when you've got something like food or fire in front of you, it's so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're all there for that same reason. And that's something I want to look at doing um, and introducing more of doing sort of like around the country hashtag key together evenings. Um, whether they're all on one night or whether it's over a period of time, but try and sort something where we can bring the community together in our own communities so we can stretch this further than it can already. Mm -hmm. Definitely let us know. Yeah. When you know when, when you launch this and obviously we'll we'll you know more than happily shout it shout it to the rooftops. Mm. Yeah. I think it's 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 needed for for a lot of people, this past nearly two and a half, going on three years now, has got to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, whether it's people that are still in their jobs and are getting sick and tired of working from home, whether it's people like me who can't work from home and are sick and tired of people working from home because <laughs> you can't do your job from home, um, or the people that have lost their job and have had to go and do something else that they don't particularly want to do but they have to be because of it it's played with everyone losing people for covid it's stuck wearing a mask all the bloody time it has messed a lot of people's brains up and if there's any way that we can help by just sharing some cracking food and chat that's an easy thing to do mm -hmm. Can agree if you look back at lockdown, the best times that anyone had at lockdown was when people were sharing food. That first lockdown, that first six months, when people were opening their front door and talking to their people next door or the other next door and they were yeah. sharing food. Over. That stopped already. Once that lockdown lifted, we didn't even talk to our neighbours again. It was sort of like there was an imaginary barrier that came back up again. When we were all locked down and we couldn't do anything, everyone talked to each other. Yeah. That needs to stop and everyone needs to talk to each other anyway. Mm. Because then everyone was at their happiest when the sun was out, everyone was bar 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 excuse me, barbecuing and chatting. We need to all do that again all throughout the year. Yeah. Let's get some houses going around the country and get people happy in a happier place where we can all share these experiences um, to help one another. Definitely. Like 
Sounds like it'd be the Gandhi of barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it, it sounds like you're, you're, you're on your way to opening your own charity right there, Dan. Yeah, so a charity, barbecue school, and chef table, all in, all in one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's something that I want to do this year is uh, yeah. extend the queue together. For, uh, I know that Russ and Joe are big um, barbecue, uh, the queue together guys. Um, but I, I just think it's fantastic what they've done. I just want to extend it for them in, in any way I can. Great. Well, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure ha- having mm-hmm. you on, on the podcast. Um, it's been an honour to be the last to do it, mate. Um, <laughs> thank you both. Yeah, um, no, appreciate it. And I th- again, I think you've given us, and everyone listening, I think you know they'll have some, there's some great tips to take away there. Uh, I think there's some important things that we've just been discussing. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you again at Sizzle Fest. We're already yeah. booked up and hotels and tickets done. So that's super yeah. exciting. Um, and, and yeah, just uh, really, really appreciate you, you coming on to the podcast. Okay. I'll let you know how I get on with the, uh, the trade <laughs> yeah, yeah dr- dr- drop me a message it'll be interesting <laughs> lovely yeah. all right well thanks very much for coming on dan yeah thanks so much thank you very much cheers, cheers. Bye. 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 that's it for another episode of the meet and greet barbecue podcast it was great to talk to dan from urban street street i think there were some great tips and talking about you know mental health and you know men having a conversation and using barbecues as a, as a platform to get around and, and socialize is so important as ever we want to hear from you tell us what to talk about on the podcast what's important to you around barbecue get in touch with us through the usual channels email uh, meet and greet barbecue podcast at gmail.com the social channels at meet and greet barbecue podcast if you haven't done so already, join our newly launched Facebook group, the Meet and Greet Barbecue Podcast group, where you can post in, uh, get involved, share your creations on the barbecue. And until next week, keep on grilling. Today's episode is brought to you by AOS Kitchens, the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists.